Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, David. Appreciate that. I just want to say welcome, everyone. Good evening. On behalf of the faculty and the students uh, and some of our distinguished alumni and deans, former deans and directors of the iSchool at the University of South Carolina, welcome. I'm Tom Reichert, uh, very humbled and honored to be the Dean of the College of Information and Communications. I have the distinct honor of introducing our keynote speaker tonight, Mr. Crosby Kemper, and I'm very much looking forward to his remarks. Uh, Mr. Kemper is the sixth director of the Institute of Museum and Library Services. He was commissioned by the White House on January of 2020. IMLS, uh, an independent government agency, is the primary source of federal support for the nation's museums and libraries. Now, Mr. Kipper is a, uh, is a dedicated advocate for education and learning for people of all ages and backgrounds. He comes to the IMLS from the Kansas City Public Library, where as director, he established it as one of the city's leading cultural destinations and a hub of community engagement. During his directorship, the library received multiple awards, including IMLS's National Medal for Museum and Library Service. Now, interestingly, uh, Mr. Kipper did not begin his career as a librarian. He majored in an allied field, history at Yale University, and he had a distinguished career as a banker, uh, most recently serving as CEO of UMB Financial Corporation. We're very privileged to host Mr. Kemper this evening for our annual Deans and Directors Lecture. Mr. Kemper, we offer you a big down-home Southern welcome. Great to have you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Roger. And uh, David, thank you very much uh, for, uh, for inviting me. I appreciate uh, being here very much. I'm honored uh, to, to be here and uh, amongst uh, my friends in the, in the library world. I intend this to be relatively conversation, uh, conversational, um, and uh, I'm going to give you some facts and figures from our Realm project, uh, and I apologize for not actually having any uh, PowerPoint uh, to do that, so you'll have to bear, bear with me, but I'll tell you where you can find the information that, uh, that I give you as, as we uh, go along. Um, and I also intend this to be about frameworks of information. Um, I think uh, as folks who are involved in the School of Information Sciences, you should be interested in, uh, in that and uh, how, we, how we come to the information we get in the world today, uh, the problems with that, and maybe some opportunities for that. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the opportunity part towards the end. It may, I may scare you in the beginning. I intend to scare you in the beginning. So the Realm Project, Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And, uh, as a result of the fact that I showed up about at the IMLS as the director uh, about six weeks before the pandemic started. So it was handed to me as my first interesting challenge <clears throat> as a director. And the first thing we did uh, when it, it became clear that there were going to be shutdowns and that the virus was, was a pandemic in nature was to get the CDC to do a webinar with us, which a couple of thousand librarians and some museums uh, attended. Uh, and then we, we shortly thereafter, a few days later, we did with the Smithsonian uh, a webinar with Johns Hopkins that was primarily museums, but also some librarians on it uh, to talk about the pandemic and its relationship to libraries and museums. You know, the interesting thing was uh, they couldn't answer basic questions about library materials, the basic questions that librarians and museums directors were uh, asking. Uh, every time a question came up about social distancing in a public space, about materials, about surfaces, uh, pretty much the folks at CDC and the folks at Johns Hopkins said, that's an interesting question. We hadn't thought of that. And uh, it, after experiencing this twice, um, we, we thought, and we talked to the Smithsonian Library of Congress about this, we thought maybe we should do some original research. And we had some money from the CARES Act, and we got some money, significant grant from the Mellon Foundation, Carnegie Corp, and a lot of help from the Library of Congress too, financial help, and, and a lot of uh, other kinds of help from Smithsonian and the FAIC and others. Uh, and we hired Battelle, which already had in Columbus, Ohio, which already had the virus and was working on laboratory uh, protocols with the Department of Health and Human Services. 
Mary Battelle, this is largely thanks to Pat Lisinski, the, uh, the director of the library uh, in uh, Columbus, uh, and, uh, and the OCLC uh, to do laboratory work, put the virus on library materials and museum materials, surfaces, books, et cetera, um, and, uh, and for the OCLC to do literature review and presentation on their Web Junction website uh, of uh, the research as it as it went along. Uh, we put together a pretty great scientific advisory uh, committee that included the, the Smithsonian, of course, and the Library of Congress, NARA, the FAIC uh, from the government, and folks from Yale, UCLA, NYU, uh, and others as we we went along. Uh, and, and so the, we got the, the, the virus on on books and, and and we did this in in aid of initially safety uh, of library patrons and library staff, library materials, um, and and also in aid of as swiftly and safely as we could reopening uh, libraries uh, and museums, um, and and so we, the, what did we find? Some of you may have spent time on the on the website may know uh, all this, but we found initially a rapid decline in viral intensity on almost all materials in the first 24 hours. Big, big, uh, lovely graph of decline. Great news, but almost all materials key. Um, it didn't, it, it, there are certain materials, leather was interesting, or certain stacking of materials where it would last longer. And then we did, we did some second, uh, second time tests, follow-up tests, and they changed a little bit. So the certainty wasn't there. And most importantly, what we found, what is still true, which may be the most important thing I tell you, because it's not, it's something that you don't get in the news media, they're, they're concerned with other things. So they don't tell you this basic scientific fact. And there, there's a, we'll talk about the nature of science uh, for a minute uh, in, uh, in this conversation. Uh, but the basic scientific fact is that we don't know to this day, 15 months later, we don't know what the infectious dose is. We don't know how much viral material it takes to infect a human being. We just don't know. So that graph that would show the 24 hour steep decline is great, but it lacks certainty. And I had an alternative title for this lecture, which was, which is sexier, trust the science or trust the, the probabilities? Because that's what we're dealing with is probabilities. Um, and uh, every time you hear trust the science, we heard it a lot during the campaign, you might just want to put an asterisk on that and say this epidemiology is a science of probabilities. It's not a, so a science of exact certainty in the, in the laboratory. Um, uh, so, and, and, and my experience would be that when we heard this during the course of the pandemic, the trust of science, it almost always was not an enlightened statement. It was, it preceded usually a statement about what to do during the pandemic that wasn't truly science-based. Um, and, and, and we heard this in the library world too. Uh, now, now, part of the problem in the library world, of course, as you, you all know, is librarians love certainty. And so dealing with probabilities is tougher for librarians than, than most people because they want the facts and probabilities are in search of the facts. Um, approximations of the facts. And uh, very much in the media and the political world, probably more even than librarians wanting certainty, the assumption of certainty about the science uh, has been a problem, uh, a serious problem. But though we don't have certainty, we do know a lot. Uh, probability does lead to, to knowledge. Um, it, it's just a question of uh, the nature of that knowledge. The one thing that is very clear about this is that it's airborne. The virus is airborne. 
Um, it's something between a particle and a droplet. You may have heard those words as the science gets discussed, particle and droplet. We don't actually know exactly where it is. We don't know the infectious dose. So we don't know exactly what in the air, how much air, how much weight, yeah, uh, and therefore how much uh, floating in the air uh, the particle can do, um, which you know creates a problem uh, again about uh, how to deal uh, uh, with the defenses against the pandemic. One thing we do know that has become very clear from the epidemiology of this uh, is, and, and from the airborne nature is, uh, enclosed spaces, tightly enclosed spaces um, are the super spreaders. You've probably uh, read something somewhere about um, the uh, Sturgis motorcycle rally being a super spreader event. We do know that there are some outdoor events that lead to a significant spreading, such as the uh, uh, presentation of Amy Coney Barrett uh, uh, at the White House. Um, you probably you, you probably haven't seen the the, uh, uh, the any further results from the Sturgis event because there really is no way to tell whether it was a super spreader event. And most of it was outdoors, and there's some cell phone data and and whatnot that that does show a modest increase over an expected. Uh, uh, result in, in uh, counties in South Dakota and Minnesota, nearby in Minnesota, uh, but we don't really know, and there's no way to really know if it was a super spreader, in part because of the numerator de denominator uh, uh, question. We don't know exactly what the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the viral events should have been in those counties in, uh, uh, in Minnesota uh, next door to uh, Sturgis. We just don't. We just don't know. So there's a, an estimate that it might have been an increase of six percent or twelve percent between six percent and twelve percent, but that's really that's a total guesstimate. That's it's not even probability. It's it's a it's a guess. Um, uh, and herein lies a problem. So we know we know that enclosed spaces are are a problem. But what a, what about when we're walking around in the street or we're you're in a library? Uh, central, uh, central library atrium, or um, wh 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 how good are the masks? You may have noticed that Dr. Fauci has had different views of the mask over time. You know, and now, now we're, you know, we've we've gone through a double mask phase. Well, the truth is, masks are permeable, so we know uh, that some viral material can get through in both directions. Um, so two masks would be better, probably pretty much guarantee things. Um, we also know historically that in, in pandemics, folks have worn masks. Um, historically, they, social distancing is a thing. Um, and, and, and so it, masks are important. We know, we know that. We just don't know how important they are. I get very excited because I see myself as a libertarian um, I, uh, by uh, 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 political choice. Um, when the Great Barrington, these folks got together in Great Barrington, a bunch of libertarians, some philosophers, some, some scientists, uh, some public policy people, and some nutcases, I think. And they got together and they issued this statement um, uh, that I get pretty excited about because they said, you don't really need to wear masks. They were using uh, things that happened in Sweden and a few other places and some assumptions about, uh, uh, about the virus. And they said, you don't really need to wear masks. Uh, we should all go back to uh, to school, um, and uh, 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 if things will be better because we're going to experience herd immunity very quickly. The Swedish Swedish assumption. Um, uh, I get very excited about this. Um, I have a friend who's a dedicated um, uh, populist libertarian who was not wearing a mask, and we had a little debate about that. I said, I think really, you know, they're not right about the mask thing. I, you know, they. Uh, but and even if they are, just be safe. And he wouldn't do it. And he got he got the virus. And we haven't talked a whole lot in the last year, but um, since then. Um, and, and so I I refer back to history and common sense about this. Of course, the mask is going to help. Uh, of course, social distancing is going to help. We don't know exactly how much, but we know that's basically true. So. As it turns out, Great Barrington, the Great Barrington statement was wrong about masks. Um, it was wrong about uh, whether or not young people can spread the virus. There was a, a statement in the, in this, within the statement that 
that young people were not spreading the virus. They were a little closer to the truth with that. There, there is much less spreading uh, from young people. Um, uh, uh, and they were very wrong about the herd, herd immunity uh, uh, thing. Um, I want to talk for a minute about the other side. So that's the libertarian side. And, you know, part of this, part of what I want to tell you is the framework for, uh, for the spread of information about, uh, about the virus has been ideologically driven. The Great Barrington folks were ideologically driven. I happen to be friendly to their view of the, uh, of the, of the world, but it, they weren't dealing with the science. And this is partly because you couldn't deal with the science because the science there was no certainty, particularly at that at that point. The epidemiology wasn't clear because we hadn't worked through a full set of seasons, uh, et cetera. Uh, but on the other side of the political field, and I, I'm going to use a couple of uh, graphs from the New York Times here. This one is from yesterday. Sorry, I don't have a PowerPoint. I just some of you may have seen it. You may read the New York Times. This. Is, four columns of the six columns of the New York Times, two graphs about vaccine acceptance uh, and, uh, and, and vaccine rollout, actual uh, vaccines uh, um, uh, uh, made uh, in uh, all 50 states. And the point of the graph actually is Republicans bad, Democrats good, uh, which is with the New York Times has essentially been their, their ideological framework for the, uh, for the pandemic. Um, and it's counties, it's based on counties, which is itself uh, a little bit odd. Um, and uh, uh, the, w one notices that, uh, the, you know, the, uh, particularly in the, the first graph, which is the vac vaccine acceptance, um, this, this one, uh, uh, there, there's a big distinction. Now that's just people saying whether or not they're gonna get the vaccine, vaccine what they think about it. We did uh, in the Realm project or a related project that Smithsonian and the CDC did in cooperation with us. Um, uh, we saw much smaller numbers uh, in terms of uh, the rejection. Now, of course, I think we took our survey maybe a little bit later than they took their survey. And you may know that there is a, a change over time as we roll the vaccine out and it seemed to be successful, more and more people are, are accepting it. Though there, of course, are large and interesting exceptions to that, such as healthcare workers. All healthcare workers in the United States have been offered the vaccine. There are still 20% of our healthcare workers who have not been vaccinated. And that, that is a curious thing. And I don't think that actually relates in any way, shape, or form to the Republican Democrat framework that both the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, which I will get to in a minute, uh, have, have used uh, in this. Um, so uh, uh, the, the real problem is that this is without real context. So at one point in the fall, I happen to be fairly close to where I am. I'm in Kansas City in my basement. Uh, uh, being the director of the IMLS, we're 100% teleworking. But in the fall, I noticed that for a few weeks, the number one county in the United States for viral infections was Norton County, Kansas. And I know where Norton County is, and I thought that was odd. Uh, and, and so I looked at it carefully, and it's a small county, about 5,000 people, uh, and the, all the infections were the result of two locations, and this will this seemed familiar. Uh, one was a prison, local prison, and one was a senior uh, citizen uh, home. And uh, virtually everybody in both places uh, got the virus and they shot up to uh, the, the highest percentage in the, in the country. Now, Kansas is a Republican state uh, with a Democratic governor. And I will tell you that what happened in Norton County, Kansas had absolutely nothing to do with the legislature or the governor. It had to do with not terribly well run enclosed spaces, tightly enclosed, intensely used, not very well ventilated spaces. Um, local policy, maybe healthcare policy at the local level, maybe uh, healthcare policy around uh, uh, up updating HVAC systems for senior citizens' homes, uh, maybe. But the kind of public policy that New York Times and the Wall Street Journal have been writing about so often had nothing to do with Norton County, Kansas, becoming the number one site for the virus from a percentage point of view for a few weeks in the fall. Um, and uh, 
in, in any case, one, one needs to, to look at some other statistics to put uh, these statistics uh, into uh, uh, their proper framework, uh, a non-political framework. We now know, we've known for quite some time, 80% of the deaths are people over the age of 65. 80% of the deaths of people over the age of 65, roughly somewhere between 40 and 50%, this depends a lot, definitional inexactitude, um, are in these enclosed spaces, prisons, meatpacking plants, senior citizen centers. Um, and for instance, in Kansas City, the largest single outbreak of the virus was in a paper processing plant, a plant that I'd been in when I was both a banker and a librarian. There customer when I was a banker and a vendor when I was a uh, librarian. And it's a tightly enclosed space, very low ceilings, ancient HVAC, only one exit, no windows, uh, high intensity environment. Um, and and they, they were the super spreader event in, in, uh, uh, in Kansas City. Again, and nothing to do with public policy. Um, one could say that the only example that I will give you where I think a public policy had a huge effect is Governor Cuomo's decision to put people uh, into, uh, with the virus into senior citizens uh, centers in New York. And not, all, not only a bad decision from a public health point of view, but he covered it up, which is a bad decision from every point of view. Um, uh, other than that, I think you would be hard pressed to find a public policy decision uh, that's had a big effect on on the statistics, and you can you can show that probably with the the basic statistic. If the New York Times had had wanted to uh, be contextually honest, they would they would have there would have been something in their in their uh, near their graphs um, uh, from uh, from yesterday uh, about this the ultimate outcome uh, statistics. Uh, which are available every day, change every day. And you can see Johns Hopkins website, Statista, the CDC. The CDC is sometimes a little late in putting these up. Statista seems to me to be the best. And yesterday when they put this graph up, the Republicans bad, Democrats good, uh, graph up, uh, the, the numbers were the, the highest uh, death per capita rate uh, in the country is New Jersey. The second highest is New York. The third highest is Massachusetts. The fourth highest is Rhode Island. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. Again, uh, some of which are, are some of which are public policy, specifically Governor Cuomo's, um, but mostly not public policy events. They're cycle events. They're uh, travel uh, reasons. Uh, lo lots of individual uh, reasons for this. Um, the Times has tended to, and the Wall Street Journal has tended to, to make a uh, make this a contest between uh, New York and California on one side, Governor Cuomo uh, and Governor Newsom on one side, um, and Governor DeSantis uh, and Governor Abbott of Florida and Texas on the other side. And so what do we know about that? Well, we know that Florida, Texas, and California are all bunched together in the middle in terms of the death per capita. Um, and New York's near the, near the top, but there are some special circumstances uh, for that. We also know the, the following, and this to me is, is, I wish I could put this up as a, a slide, but, um, uh, and this actually uh, was in the New York Times online, New York Times yesterday. Uh, and this is a graph by age uh, of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the percentages. And they start out in the graph with the, I'm not sure why they did this, the 50 to 64, uh, which is 0 0.027 per 100,000, which is 265 uh, people have died per 100,000 population in that age range. Then they have the 65 plus, and they don't actually give you the number, it's just the percentage, which is 2.24. Now, you're probably not following this closely enough to know that that's roughly 10 times the 50 to 64, over 65, 10 times the 50 to 64. And then they give you, interestingly enough, the five to 17. This actually startled me uh, from what I'd known previously. Uh, so I've been following this pretty closely and this startled me yesterday. Five to 17 year olds, 0 .0 0.002, two per 100,000. 
you could do the math or the percentages on that. That's 10 times 10 times. Um, and then zero to four, which is slightly surprising because of the five to 17 is 0 0.005 or five per 100,000. You add all this together, you look at this together and age is huge. It's huge in this. You go back to the Great Barrington folks and the Great Barrington folks were a little bit closer to the truth in a way than the CDC uh, at the time when they, uh, when they issued their, uh, their statement. The, 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 the death rate for people under 17 is essentially a flu season. Um, and uh, we should have opened schools sooner than we did. Great Barrington was essentially uh, right about that. The Wall Street Journal, if you, if you want to go that direction, was essentially right about that. These are fairly extraordinary numbers. Um, and, uh, and so why am I telling you all this? Um, well, it's, it's about the framework. The, the, the New York Times and the, and the Washington Post, which I read every day, the Wall Street Journal, which I read every day, have tried on both sides to turn this into a political contest. And the virus has resisted that. The virus is not uh, playing politics uh, with this. Um, I mean, the, the one political decision, again, I, I would say that the, that did make a difference was Governor Cuomo's decision on uh, 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 putting people, taking people out of hospitals where they had the virus and putting them into senior, senior homes. Um, and that's not just a, a, a bad decision, but it's a, it was essentially uh, uh, a, a catastrophic decision. And it was also, uh, he also covered it up, which was an immoral and unethical uh, decision. I, I've watched what, what's going on in Missouri and Kansas, a Democratic governor in Kansas, a Republican governor in Missouri. Um, she's paid more attention to 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 uh, uh, to the virus, uh, uh, Governor uh, Kelly, uh, then Governor Parsons did, though he got the virus and he started paying attention after that. And there's really almost no difference between Kansas and Missouri. They're both pretty much in the uh, in the middle, despite a lot of attention at one point to uh, to Missouri's outbreak at the Lake of the Ozarks. So. This is a reflection of a problem in our country. And now I get to you know, what libraries can do about this. How bad is our problem? Well, today in the New York Times, I will read you a paragraph from David Brooks. The level of Republican pessimism is off the charts. A February uh, Economist YouGov poll asked Americans which statement is the closest to their view. It's a big, beautiful world, mostly full of good people, and we must find a way to embrace each other and not allow ourselves to become isolated. Or our lives are threatened by terrorists, criminals, and illegal immigrants, and our priority should be to protect ourselves. Over 75% of Biden voters chose a big, beautiful world. Two-thirds of Trump voters chose our lives are threatened by terrorists and criminals. Okay. I'm gonna say that's the dumbest poll I've ever seen in my entire life. And I can't believe that someone as intelligent as David Brooks actually thinks that represents anything, but it's a sign of the frameworks that we're living in um, that, are, uh, that are, are affecting us in a huge way. Um, I, I, there's a book that I would highly recommend uh, by a guy named David Sumter called Outnumbered. And, and David Sumter in this book talks about uh, Facebook, Google, fake, fake news, and the importance of algorithms. And we've all learned that al we're, we're, our lives are being run by algorithms uh, uh, that big tech has. And, and we know that Amazon's pretty good now at suggesting books to us and, uh, and stuff like that. And, and, and so he, he examines, uh, examines this. And uh, and there's good news and bad news from uh, from the frameworks that big tech uh, is is giving to us. Uh, now, the bad news is that a certain percentage of people uh, on the uh, the right uh, are convinced, have been convinced on on social media, uh, that the Clinton Foundation uh, spent 175 million dollars buying arms for somebody, um, and. Uh, a certain number of people uh, on the right um, are, are absolutely convinced uh, that uh, uh, in 2016, uh, that uh, as the election, it became clear that Donald Trump might win, um, uh, that the uh, Irish government was preparing uh, 
uh, to offer asylum to, uh, to liberals who wanted to escape the United States. Um, and I, th this uh, reflects my experience with certain people. I have a friend uh, who was a significant person in the library world uh, and another friend who was a significant person in the political world, They're both uh, older women, but women of great common sense, uh, intelligence and experience in the, in the real world. One of them called me up so a couple of years ago. One of them called me up. Uh, they, uh, these happened in the same week, which is why I use, use this, and, and said, you know, I and she's my conservative friend. She said, I've heard that Paul Krugman declared bankruptcy. I said, I don't think so. I went to Snopes. Of course, it was a meme that was going around. and It was untrue, of course. The other, uh, my other friend called me up a couple of days later and said, have you heard what Ann Coulter did? And I said, no, tell me. And she said, um, she got on a plane that had an African-American pilot and she turned to the, uh, to the passengers and said, you have to get off. This woman is clearly affirmative action and unqualified. He said, oh, I don't know, it doesn't sound true. And I went to Snopes and sure enough, it was a meme that was going around. These two very smart people had their biases confirmed, confirmation bias uh, uh, at work. Um, now, the good news is, David Sumter says there's a, you know, a huge amount of that going around, but it is all confirmation bias. Nobody's opinions are really being changed uh, by these algorithms uh, and, uh, uh, and internet uh, memes. On the other hand, he does say there are some interesting statistics in this book in which he talks about the more you're on the internet, the more likely, the more use of the internet you are, the more likely two things are to happen. One, your word choices get more and more negative. I have two children, one on the right, one on the left, for whom this is obviously true. They've spent way too much on time on the internet and their responses to my, my texts have gotten much more negative. Um, it's a little bit of a joke, but it's actually, there's actually real truth to it. And the second, the second thing is the longer you, there is a relationship of the longer you time you, you spend on the internet to your belief in conspiracy theories. And I, I find that uh, particularly interested, interesting. Now, the good news is, he will tell you, is that there's no evidence um, that uh, the, uh, uh, the hacking by the, uh, by the Russian trolls had an influence on either the 2016, 2016 or the 2020 uh, election. So there's good news and bad news on, on the internet, but our frameworks are, are being challenged. So at moments like this, I turn to de Tocqueville. Um, and, 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 and de Tocqueville, talks about the strength of America uh, is at the at local level, the, the desire of Americans to form associations to deal with problems. Um, the, the, uh, the, the desire of Americans to be educated to a certain level. He says, America is the most enlightened country. There are very few learned people in America, but the average level of Americans is very high. Now, the average education level is very high. Now, I think th there are obviously certain changes that have happened since de Tocqueville's time. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I think the, the basic truth uh, that libraries as the civic anchors uh, 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 for education uh, is still true and that we do reach the largest group of people uh, of any institution other than schools and our, our our opportunity for education uh, uh, at the civic level, uh, the kind of education that Tocqueville talks about in Democracy in America, uh, which involves uh, a history and government um, and a reverence for uh, our ancestors. These are all words from Tocqueville uh, and, uh, and, and for the patria, for, for, for the patriotism of place. Um, and, 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 the libraries did public libraries didn't really exist when Tocqueville was writing Democracy in America, but he seems to me to describe the mission uh, of libraries. Uh, he talks about the obligation uh, uh, to uh, to each other that we create in our local associations uh, in our concern for for the uh, for the country, and and I have always felt that the most important sentence uh, in 20th century political philosophy was Simone Weil's uh, 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 statement at the beginning of Need for Roots, 
General de Gaulle asked her to write the, the uh, policy for the, uh, the resistance and, and the French and ultimately the French government uh, after the liberation uh, of France in World War II. And uh, she called it the need for roots or that's the English translation. And her first sentence was, obligations precede rights. And I believe that that's true. We are we're rights uh, 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 inebriated uh, country and there's a good thing about that. And Tocqueville talks about rights uh, and virtues being allied uh, but, he, but he talks about it in terms of the obligations that we have to each other, particularly at the local level. And, and so I, I want to say that it is, it, it's the libraries, it is a necessity for libraries today to take these frameworks that have been given to us, the right-left frameworks, and reorient them, reorient them to uh, uh, understanding that probabilities are our attempt to get close to the truth. Um, there, there is a woman named Danielle Allen, who, uh, uh, whom I, I very much admire, and she's used the phrase libraries as civic anchors. And the IMLS has funded some of her work with libraries and uh, schools, high schools in Massachusetts, and she's embarked with the Library of Congress on something called Our Common Purpose. And Our Common Purpose is an attempt to reignite uh, the the uh, the civic conversation in America, and they have a lot of ideas about techniques and things that we should change, rank order uh, voting and uh, and other things like that. Some some of which I agree with, some of which I don't agree with. But uh, Daniel and I have been talking, and I'm hoping hopeful that she will help inform a project at the IMLS uh, uh, on civic engagement as we go into America 250, the 250th anniversary of the United States to try and, as she puts it, uh, our country was built on a conversation about government. And, and, and I wanna try to reinvigorate that conversation with her help, the Library of Congress, uh, Smithsonian and, and others as we go into uh, the 250th anniversary. It's, it's one of the things we know is it's very hard if you're face to face with someone uh, to not try to find some common ground, some common purpose, uh, some shared story, some shared ideal. And we need, we need to be doing that. Libraries need to be uh, the place where we have these civic conversations, where we have dialogues and debates, uh, uh, where we find each other uh, 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 together and find something about each other uh, that, we can, uh, that we can share. I say this with a lot of humility. Um, I, I, one thing that, that has been true for me uh, as a director during this pandemic time is to watch so many people with so much purpose inside the IMLS, inside other parts of the government, inside libraries and museums around the country, so many people struggling so hard to offer their communities something to hold on to, something to refresh them, something to educate them, something to entertain and enlighten them. Libraries have done such a great job during this period. And I think the trust for libraries has never been higher because people see us doing those things uh, for them. And so there's an opportunity as we come out of this to take these political frameworks, these over, over politicized frameworks that we've been given by the media uh, and turn them into something uh, that can engage people and, and refresh their view uh, of each other. So um, I, I'll end with that, with that thought. Um, and I would be happy to turn this into a conversation about this. Um, I have many other things I could say about the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal and, and how they treated the, the pandemic uh, and 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 what we what we what we now know about the the pandemic. I have many other things I can say about what libraries have done successfully during the pandemic. I'd be happy to engage on on any of those uh, any of those subjects. Very good. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Um, for those who don't know, I, my name is David Lankus. I'm the director of the School of Information Science. We have the chat where you can ask questions. Also, if you raise your hand, and there are enough of us that if you just want to turn on your camera and wave, I can see that. But if I could take the, the privilege of the first question, I'm thinking uh, for a moment where you talked about how libraries at the local level are, are giving hope um, through 
entertainment, through knowledge, through access, through connection, and the the intense trust that's built up in the local level. Um, and, and what's interesting is is I think many of the research that has been done in this program and other programs talk about trust, and the trust is not necessarily the result of simply providing accurate information, but consistently providing it and also creating an interpersonal connection. And so I'm, I'm wondering when you talk about frameworks and um, moving past frameworks, one of the questions I have in that giving hope is, as you presented the COVID data and you know this is the age group and these are the different distributions of data and et cetera, I'm wondering, um, how, how you see libraries being able to one, work on, one, the nuance of that science and probability or not, you know, how that differentiates it, but also a framework of, of the hum, humanities portion of that, the human connection portion of that, which is, it is lovely to hear of um, 0.0002%, but my son is 18 and by God, I will do anything I can to keep him from getting sick. Right? I don't want him to be the one in however many hundred thousand. You know, how do libraries fit on that trajectory where you know, they're pre presenting the data and the probabilities, but at the same time, they're really trying to help communities find meaning and connection? Uh, well, I think it, I, I, it's a hard question. Um, I, I think the, the answer to that is, uh, is changing because of the vaccine. We are going to get to some form of herd immunity uh, at some point. You know, there's a big question about whether or not that's at 70% or 90% and whether or not that includes vaccination plus people who've had the, uh, uh, the virus, you know, how the antibodies work and whatnot. And that's, those are, those are questions to which we have some information, some, some good epidemiology on that, uh, which is to say, we know that the antibodies are, are working to a significant degree, but not 100%. Um, so we're probably marching towards herd immunity sometime in the fall, I would guess. Um, and uh, and uh, the, the president talking about, you know, families being able to get together in July and stuff like that, I think is probably all, you know, reasonably uh, certain. Um, uh, so I, I think that the, the real question here is how much risk we want to take. And everybody has a different risk tolerance. So we need to acknowledge that this really is an individual decision fam or a family decision. Uh, and an 18-year-old has got a very low risk. Um, it's not non-existent, uh, but it's very low risk. It's probably not very far off the risk of the flu. Um, and uh, there, there is some evidence, but it's very small. So I wouldn't, it doesn't change my view of the probability, some risk that the variants, variants we know are a little bit more infectious uh, than, the, than the original uh, COVID. Um, uh, and it's possible, but, but we don't have enough information yet. It's possible that they are more lethal, but at the moment, it, all we know is they're marginally more uh, 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 infectious. Uh, than the original. And so it's po the, the likelihood is that we're going to get to herd immunity before there's a big effect from the variants, though you know, that may not be true in Michigan. Um, at the end of the day, it's an individual decision, David. So, I mean, you have to, you have to make that, some, you know, my wife is much more averse uh, to, uh, to going out today than I am. We, we were going to restaurants in the fall when it was much more likely, in my view, and I think a, a reasonable view of the probabilities, uh, much more likely that we could get it in, in the fall than it is now, but she doesn't want to go to a restaurant right now. Well, I'm, just, I'm 70, she's 69, so we're in a category, uh, obviously. Well, but I'm just, I'm curious, when you look at the role of libraries as trying to bring people across these different ideological frames, um, and right, even the idea that there are only two of them, we know that they're going to be much right. more. Right, there's a continuum, absolutely. Right. Um, but the question is, uh, the idea that of um, switching for a moment that we know that one of the things coming out of the, out of this pandemic is um, simply the psychological toll that it has played 
um, whether it's in isolation, whether it's in the fact that you're dealing with probabilities and not certainties, whether you're dealing with the idea of, um, you know, all sorts of, of different hard, hard year on lots of people. And so when you talk about the role of the library, one frame of the library is to be the refuge. One frame of a library is to provide data on good mental health care. Uh, another frame is to be, in essence, the, the compassionate shoulder, um, to be the, the third space that allows people to come together and feel safe in the sort of getting used to groups again. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, once again, not on the role of libraries in terms of providing information, providing accuracy, providing information, but the other idea of the libraries providing meaning, providing trust, providing connectivity within a community. I think both things are hugely important. And obviously different size libraries are gonna have different capability. And one of the things I hope, I mean, we're working on is making the, helping the platforms uh, available in the library world, you know, whether it's the DPLA or simply E or uh, 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 anything else, the Internet Archive, um, uh, help folks with with the with the information through the libraries that are you know don't don't have extra resources to do this. Uh, one of the things I hope I'm made clear to some extent is uh, it, it is the the virus is, has got local permutations uh, and 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 of course there are local healthcare rules that uh, that have. Uh, everything to do with the way we're we're all reacting. I think it's really important for librarians to stay on top of the local information about the virus, and to know things like what I said about Norton County, Kansas, or you know Kansas City's own experience, New York's experience. Of course, everybody knows about New York's experience at, at this stage, um, and 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 let people know what's going on and what the healthcare authorities are doing, because I think that should give all of us, as we're slowly but surely coming out of this. Uh, a, a great deal more uh, uh, confidence uh, in, in in what's going on, and that we can come out. And then your your point about the the trauma we've all experienced, and the uh, you know the the, the huge uh, amount of anxiety that this has created, and our need to get out and be with each other. I think that I think that's going to the post pandemic future. A lot of conversation about whether or not we're going to want to be in big groups. Uh, come together to you know go to baseball games whatever i think it's pretty clear already that we all want to get together again and i think i think because libraries are trusted places and because we'll be able to people people are a little bit better about the rules in libraries than they are in many other places that will be a great place for people to get together as soon as we all think we can get together and and there'll be a, a, a i think a dramatic increase of library attendance uh, starting sometime, you know, either at the end of this year or the beginning of, of next year, the librarians should be should be ready for and do the do the right things with so that so that we do bring people together rather, rather than keeping them apart. We do the things that are community oriented and with community partners uh, that libraries are so good at the sort of Tocquevillian things, that association at the local level that is really the core of the moral and spiritual strength of this country and that libraries are the anchors for. Um, in the chat, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Mohammadi to talk a little bit about, um, he mentions his research on connecting informal and formal media society. So, Asan. Hi, this is Asan Mohammadi. I'm assistant professor here. It's a great talk. Thank you very much. Uh, you. My research area is about scholarly communication in both formal it means in within academia and outside academia, which is the public or in social media, the influence of science on the society. I have two questions. First, I, for the next IMLS grant, I'm going to submit a grant proposal. And the topic that I'm going to just explore is with me around the science and society and how does IMLS interested in this kind of research project to explore to bridge the gap between science and society because they are not talking that much together. That's the first question, especially in the age that you highlighted a lot of things about the misinformation. Yeah, yeah, and I think particularly, I mean, science and society, particularly if the library is seen as the mediating agent in, uh, in, in, in the explanation of science to society. I mean, I think 
yeah, part of part of my point with all of this, and and I think there are a lot of scientists who would agree, is that we had the wrong people mediating uh, the information uh, during during large parts of the pandemic, and and consequently we got bad information uh, because it was politicized. I mean, the, the Great Barrington folks, you know, my my libertarian friends, off off on a toot. Now they were right about some of it, but the New York Times, in it in its way, also off on a toot. Um, and, uh, you know, in the journal, I mean, has there been any, I'd, I'd argue that the, if, if, if we were looking at this, the, the Wall Street Journal probably won on points, but I would also argue that nobody has covered themselves in, in glory in the, in the media about this. And I, the TV media is just awful. The pandemic porn that you've seen, see on CNN, you know, I showed you the number, I told you that the numbers for children who died is very, very small. I'll bet every child who died has appeared on either CNN or PBS or ABC at, at some time. Um, and, you know, the, the fear factor in, in what the, uh, the nightly news is doing is a, a, a shame. So libraries could be much better mediators for, for scientific information. It's hard for us to compete uh, with uh, with the nightly news. Uh, you know, they've got a massive audience and and uh, and various forms of entertainment that they they offer up. Um, but I but I do think there's a there, an increasingly large role for for good uh, science based information. Again, we're talking the trust the science is a uh, is sort of a misnomer because it really epidemiology is really about probabilities. But librarians are pretty good at explaining things like that. Um, maybe better than the media. Yeah, actually, Isan, before you go to your second question, just because okay. Faylee um, put a point directly to that. Faylee, could I ask you to, to share that? Sorry, my name is Faylee Tukithner. I am an associate professor at the iSchool. Lately, I have been doing a content uh, analysis study to investigate whether the top 20 public library systems in the country provides adequate COVID health information on the library website. The preliminary results are quite disappointing. Not the, well, among these top 20 and started from NYPL, uh, the last one was DC Public library. I have to say that some like like LA, they don't even post any health information at all. Um, like NYPL post a direct link to the NYCD public health or CDC, that's all. The only one would be willing to post a paragraph about the COVID uh, symptoms and some other, and of course, a lot of links to CDC, FDA, da, 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 was Denver Public Library. So- That's disappointing. I, it's disappointing. In, in, uh, in addition, we all know that how many languages spoken in the largest city like New York, like Houston, and not even one library post any health materials in different it, languages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just to spend, well, some has some Spanish link, okay, you link to the CDC's uh, link. However, if we, well, I understand that providing health information may carry on some liability issue, but ignoring posts, any health information, it's, it's also quite an interesting approach. And um, well, if we think that the public health, uh, public libraries are actually the the hubs for the local community, perhaps they could try to use a different approach to reach out the community. Yeah, I mean, be, it is, it is, so, yeah. so what we've done in the Realm Project is uh, encourage libraries to uh, link to and, and, and present from local health authorities 
uh, information because uh, again, so much so much of this is directly, particularly the you know, mask wearing and things like that are, are directly related to recommendations from local health authorities. Um, but it is dis what you say is disappointing. Uh, of course, the whole the the informational part of this has been troubling all along. The CDC is a good example. The CDC has changed its mind a lot during the course of this. Mask wearing, as an uh, as an example, uh, the uh, school openings. Now, I mean, of course, some so, some of it is ha, has to do with the change in the epidemiology and 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 vaccine rollout, um, but. Um, the, the, the presentation uh, has, has to some extent been politicized. The Trump administration was not uh, a, hap <clears throat> a happy moment in the history of depoliticized uh, science. Um, and uh, so I, you know, the part, part of it's that, but I agree with you. I think that's very disappointing that there isn't more information. In terms of things like translation, we, uh, through the Smithsonian, the Smithsonian did this for us with the Realm Project, they were providing translation services uh, to directly to libraries through the through the OCLC uh, website, uh, and and there's a vaccine rollout that just just went live this week uh, that that's from the Smithsonian site, but the CDC and the uh, and the OCLC and the, and and the IMLS are engaged with this project, and it it should have. Uh, detailed information and should be uh, translatable. There's a translation function uh, that should, I think there are a dozen or so uh, languages that, that, are, that are being used, I think. Thank you very Actually. much, sir. Thank you. That's a good point that, uh, and disappointing, you're right. Asan, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. You had a second, yeah, your second question. question. Yeah, the second, thank you, David, for just giving me this opportunity. The second question is about, uh, again, back to the science and measuring the impact of science. IMLS is funding uh, several research projects. As a funding agency that I have been involved in several research projects that to explore NSF, NIH, and outside of United States, different you know, European Union uh, projects, they have several criteria to measure the research impact of the dollar that they funded from the research project. I am interested to make that the ecosystem more sustainable. I'm interested to know what is the approach of the IMLS. Those kind of the agencies, especially NSF and NIH as the big funders in the United States, they sure. are recently moved beyond academia or broader impact. I am interested to know what is the approach of IMLS in measuring research impact or measuring evaluation of research or dollar that they allocated for research or practical projects. Yeah, so it, most of our research uh, efforts have uh, been been directed, and 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 I'm you know still relatively new at this, and I don't have that much experience with the with the actual research projects are institutionally function fo focused. In other words, it's the institution that comes to us um, and, it, and it's very widely based. So we, you know, we've fund genetic experiments uh, that zoos are, are doing. We fund uh, um, uh, projects at uh, the uh, anthropology uh, and archeology span museums like the Peabody Museums at Harvard and Yale. Um, uh, we fund uh, research projects on uh, the the uh, study of Spanish manuscripts from the 16th century. I mean, it's all uh, it's a huge, wide array. Um, I would say I would get excited about a project uh, if it looked uh, looked like. I mean, we're I think we're. We're, we're required more or less by our history and, and by, by congressional requests to, to do that kind of thing regularly. Uh, but I would be excited about anything that seemed to demonstrate uh, in the library world uh, a replicable community impact uh, uh, of something. So for instance, science, science and so society, you know, an intermediary between uh, scientific knowledge and, and the general population 
that kind of thing I would I would get excited uh, by something that would demonstrate to libraries that they could do uh, what Faley has said we're not doing um, uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, and 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 provided an incentive to do that as an example. Mr. Camper, I know we're 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 right at the time we promised we'd let you go and eat. Uh, can you take one more question? Sure, happy to. All right, I, I would like to ask. Um, uh, we have a, Tammy Blumenfeld is a current student of ours um, and heads up a bunch of special projects for us, and I believe she has a question. Tammy, can you share? Sure. Um, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I actually just typed in my question because I wasn't sure of the format, but um, I think you started to answer it a little bit talking about the role that libraries could play in, in providing science information. Um, but my question was basically, you know, how can libraries play a role in countering disinformation more broadly speaking? And um, do you see that you know, libraries kind of need to take more of an activist role in the future. And I guess maybe there's a personal answer and also an I am a less official answer. Yeah, I don't know if there's an I am a less official answer for this. So this is mostly uh, mostly personal. We're very concerned about this. Um, and, you know, I spent some time talking to folks in Congress about this. There are some people, particularly on the Democratic side in the House, um, who are interested in this, and one senator in particular on the Democratic side who's interested. There's, there, there's, there are proposals for uh, an information, disinformation commission that the IMLS might be involved in, uh, and I might be involved in. And, uh, you know, I've spent some, a lot of time at the Knight Foundation. Very, they, every year they have a, a library uh, directors and others meeting, uh, and this is a subject of conversation every year. Um, I, I think, I, I guess I, I tried to allude to this a little bit, and I would, I would urge you to read books like David Sumter's Outnumbered, which is about algorithms and, and about d disinformation, or there's a, a, a book that I find very useful. Uh, it's a few years old, and the author's no longer with us, but um, uh, it's, uh, it's called Factfulness by Hans Rosling, who was a uh, part of uh, Doctors Without Borders. It has an interesting uh, a test at the beginning that he gave to Nobel Prize winners who didn't do too well on the test. Um, I think that I, I think disinformation is is with us to stay, and it's been with us forever. Um, it's a little worse when it goes goes viral. It, you know, and I, I talked about the you know two stories that my two friends uh, told me in the same in the same week. But I think there's also a fair amount of self-correction on the, on the internet uh, about uh, misinformation. And one of the things that Sumter says that I think is very important, and there, there are a whole series of books on, on this, um, is that essentially what we're talking about with mis disinformation is usually it, it involves confirmation bias. The people who are reading it and believing it already believe something in, in that direction. The, the thing that's worrisome is that intensity of use of the internet tends to breed more extreme versions uh, of, of, of this. Um, but again, it, it, one interesting thing he says that Sumter says is he said, uh, the, the people who seem to, uh, to, to be um, immune to conspiracy theories are precisely the people, undecided voters, for instance, are immune to conspiracy theater. There is that that that's kind of uh, uh, relief relieving. Um, I, I don't I don't know that there's a there's a really good answer to this. I think libraries at the local level should try to be information specialists and therefore also disinformation specialists. Um, and you know, with city government, for instance, I think there's a way for local libraries, and some do. When I was a Kansas City Public Library director, we tried uh, and, and had some success in holding the, uh, the uh, a light on the uh, on what the city was actually doing, the tax system, for instance, tax increment financing, as an example, um, and uh, uh, crime rates and stuff like that, uh, where the city the city had some interest in not being completely um, transparent. And, and, and so we worked on that. And I, th I think that's possible. The disinformation at the national level 
is, is very hard. But on the other hand, as I say, it usually involves confirmation bias. So, you know, who, who really believes that uh, President Obama uh, was, uh, was born in Kenya or wherever, you know, people, the birthers say, say he was, who really believes that, uh, that George Bush knew about uh, 9-11 uh, before it happened? Well, those tend not to be people who are asking questions at the, you know, at, at the reference desk uh, or go to the library website. They're people who, who are on the internet in order to prove that they were right, uh, that, that, uh, that, that George knew about 9-11 and Barack uh, was born in, you know, in Kenya. How do we get so some of the You're not going to have much effect on this. Question. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, Mr. Kemper, thank you very much. IMLS is an extraordinarily important agency. I always say it punches above its weight in terms of its ability to support the great work of libraries and librarianship. And I want to thank you for continuing on uh, that great work. Uh, and I want to thank you for being willing to engage in conversation. And um, this is not the last conversation that we're going to be having. Um, we're, I don't know. Yeah, we're going to be supporting some work coming forward on some symposia in the fall, and I know right. we can't we can't um, in any way influence your decision on some amazing proposals that are in the second round currently. But there are. <laughs> uh, but uh, anyway, it's really good to once again bring multiple perspectives uh, to the group, and so thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate thank, it. Thank you all very much. It's very very nice to be here. I appreciate it. Appreciate the invitation.